see everybody this morning, and welcome if you're joining us online as well. And uh, we're going to get started with our service here in just a moment. So if you're in the back, make your way in, and we're uh, delighted to have you here. I get to host today. Uh, I haven't done this for like six months, so I'll probably goof this job up terribly, and then they'll say, you know, you're not doing that job anymore. Uh, but my name's Aaron Henning, and it's delighted to, I'm delighted to welcome you here to our church service. I've got a couple of announcements that I want to highlight for you, and noting that uh, your bulletin has a lot of exciting things. This is a really... Uh, high impact time of the year where a lot of things are going to be starting up and a lot of ministries kicking off. And uh, so I'm going to highlight just three that are on the front, but I would encourage you to look through your bulletin, whether you get it in your inbox uh, every week or if you pick it up in paper form when you come to church, that's fine as well. Uh, we also want to encourage you to check in with us and let us know that you are here. So you can do that simply by using the QR code, which is up on the screen and here if you've got a smartphone. And if you don't know how to do that, that's okay as well. Uh, you can fill out the little guest uh, card that's on the, in the chair uh, pocket in front of you, but it's great to know uh, that you are here. Um, so here's a couple announcements that we want to make you aware of. Prime Timers Brunch is happening this Tuesday. How many of you have gone to a Prime Timers Brunch before? We got a good handful of you, so that's going to be happening. Prime Timers is for anyone that is in the prime of your life, or if you think you're in the prime of your life. I think they don't card you. They just say, come on in. And it's actually a wonderful gathering of people, lunch, uh, luncheon out in the lobby. And uh, this particular one, uh, we always have a guest speaker that comes in. Bill Jester, who, is, who runs our children's ministry, is going to be our guest speaker. And we've just come off Alliance Sports Camp, and he's got some exciting things to share about our next-gen ministries. And so uh, if you would like to join for the Prime Timers event, um, that is happening on Tuesday. Uh, you can contact Pastor Chad if you have any questions about that, and his information is there in the bulletin. Uh, introduction to community group leaders, that's going to be actually happening next Sunday. Now, many of you are involved in community groups. Some of you have led community groups. Uh, this is specifically for those who are interested in the latter. If you are uh, interested in leading a community group, that's really a lifeblood of our fellowship and, and uh, edification of the body as we're building uh, up the body here. And so we would love for you uh, to step in into that, and uh, Pastor Chad will be running that meeting uh, next uh, Sunday. It'll be happening right after our second service. Uh, there will be lunch and child care provided, so if you feel like you'd like to be a part of that and think about what would it mean for you to actually lead a community group here, uh, we would love for you to explore that with us. And then the last one, food pack. How many of you participated in the Feed My Starving Children food pack? We did that a couple of years ago was the last time we did it. I know a lot of you did that. Well, this, I love this event. This is one of my most exciting events that we do uh, as we pull in people from all over the community and, of course, our church. And, uh, and, and we're literally feeding children that would not otherwise have meals. That's going to be happening on September 16th and 17th. So they're going to be doing a Friday pack as well as, uh, I think, one session in the evening, 6 to 8, and then uh, throughout the day on September 17th. And so we want you to look into that, volunteer for that, sign up, donate. Uh, there will be lots of donations that will be needed to, to sequester all of the supplies and things like that. So we're excited to see how God's going to to use that particular event again and a wonderful opportunity invite your neighbors we invited our neighbors out to that and have had people come out that never been part of our church before but we say hey help us make an impact in the world and people often are very responsive to that uh, so it's a great opportunity to build some connections and relational uh, relational connectivity all right I think that's what we've got uh, worship teams ready to lead us why don't we stand together as we look to the Lord and lift up the name of Jesus together Good morning, church. Hear these words from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. We are going to lift up some songs of praise right now, starting with number 37, um, a chorus that may be new to some of you, new as of 1984, uh, and we will go right into hymn number 38, an old Wesley hymn after that.
Church, we come together with one voice to give God his right, our praise, our adoration, our thanks, and to pour out our love. But we love him not because this life of faith is easy, but because he first loved each of us. So let's remind ourselves of that unfathomable depth of love that he gives us through all circumstances in our lives as we sing hymn number 606 together. statements that Jesus made to his disciples when he was on this earth was this. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Would you sing with us hymn number 624, His Eye is on the Sparrow, as we rest in that truth.
Cheryl, could I ask you just to continue to play over us for a moment as we as we pray? Uh, church, we're going to do something special this morning in our prayer time. And I actually have really come to love these times in our worship when we look to the Lord together. Um, the fact that the Lord sees you today. He sees me. He sees you. He sees you right where you are. That's a really special thought. Um, he knows our hurts and he knows our he knows our hearts. He knows our hopes. Um, and so there's a, there's a confidence that we have coming into his presence. What I'd like you to do as we pray this morning is go ahead and have a seat. And then I'm going to ask a few people to stand because I don't know if you have noticed, but there's some extra activity in our town these days. School's starting, Penn State's starting, and everything's starting to feel sort of crowded. And we want to commission... Uh, some of our folks that are called to be on the front lines of some exciting opportunities in this season. So if you're here today and you are a Penn State faculty, staff, student, or part of a campus ministry, uh, can I just ask you to stand up? We want to we wanna just acknowledge you. Okay, we got several that are here. Okay, praise the Lord. Then also, I want to add today, in our local school districts, if you are a teacher or a student or part of faculty and staff, would you stand up as well? Okay, got several people that are dotted around. Now, uh, in this season and at this time, and as we pray, uh, we're going to sort of flex our prayer muscles. We're going to intercede for you today, noting that God has placed you at this time and in this place where he wants you to be. You are part of the priesthood of believers. And so we want to commission you today in prayer and encourage you as God has a new season for you and new ministries in store for you. So would you receive this as a prayer? And if you're joining us here today or online, would you lift up these people in prayer as well, especially if you know some folks that are around you, let put a hand in their direction and, and lift them up in prayer. So Jesus, we're grateful uh, that you have called us uh, to be your hands and feet in uh, such a wonderful variety of ways and places. And we don't want to miss this opportunity to come before these wonderful individuals, teachers and students, faculty members, uh, campus ministers, God, and to recognize your calling on their life for this time. What a great privilege it is for us to pray for them. And so for you men and women that are standing here today, may your heart be sensitive to the Spirit's leading in this new season. May you experience divine appointments that are just filled with kingdom opportunity. We pray that over you. And may you always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. And may you do it with gentleness and respect. Lord, we hold these men and women before you, and we bless them today in Jesus' name, and we commission them to good kingdom work that you have for them in this new school year. What a privilege for us to be able to pray in this direction. We pray all this in the strong name of Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Some of you are standing up and say, I didn't know he was going to do that today. Well, it's, a, it's kind of a journey. You come to church, you don't quite know what you're going to get into. But today, we want to bless you and we want to encourage you and continue to pray for you in that direction. Um, we have a real uh, joy today, and I'm going to welcome Nate Howard to come up here in just a moment uh, to bring the word to us. Nate Howard is our super, uh, district superintendent, our super district superintendent. A uh, little slip, but that's, uh, I think that's accurate as well. Uh, and Nate and his wife Sharon are here right up in the in the front and uh, just wonderful leadership They've been in leadership in our district now for the last four years. Is that right? 
And um, so Nate serves as a, a pastor to the pastors of the district. So he's my pastor. And uh, we've had the privilege of having him here before. And it's always a joy. I talked to someone in the lobby who said, oh, I just always love it when he preaches. And so uh, you're in for a real treat today. And he's just going to jump into the series that we have been doing, uh, Change Your World. And so he's going to be preaching to us from Acts chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture. It's rather long. So if you would follow along, we have it on the screen as well. Uh, that we want to help you to, to be anchored in this today. And so I'll give that reading, and then I'll welcome Nate to come up and, uh, and preach to us today. Uh, Acts chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 17 and read through verse 42. It says, Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy, and they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went and reported, uh, went back and reported. We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the door, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Verse 25, then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appears, appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed. And it all came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. May God a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. And can we give a warm State College welcome to my pastor, Nate Howard. It is a joy to be here. And as, um, as just a guy who did pastoral ministry for many, many years, and now I'm in this role, it's always a joy when a pastor asks me to preach into the series, because it's actually something I don't get to do a whole lot. So I get to preach a text that I've actually never preached before, and a sermon that I've never preached before, and, and we'll see how it goes. 
You see the title of the sermon, right? When Worlds Collide. I know a little bit about worlds colliding because of the role that I'm in. My job is to pastor situations that often are very difficult. Never had one here at State College Alliance. Um, that day may come, and you may be, see me under a different set of circumstances, but currently I am pastoring people through 17 pastoral crises. And by pastor crisis, I mean like I got a call this week from a, a pastor who's broken, and he said, Nate, I know you're not my counselor, but I got to let you know, I'm pretty sure my wife's going to leave me. 17 pastoral crises, 11 church crises. And a church crisis is like a nuclear bomb gone off in the church and it's about ready to explode. So I know a little bit about worlds in like clashing, right? When, when a world is clashing, you know about that as well. So our culture in general feels that, right? We've been through COVID and all of us know a little bit about worlds colliding, worlds crashing. But it can even be on a personal level, like when there's something going on in your home, when there's something going on in you physically, and you feel like, it feels like our worlds are colliding. That's what this text is about. And I think it has significant perspective for us. But for us to understand the text that Pastor Aaron just read for us, you, you, you really have to get the big picture of what's happening here. Because this story that we read really begins in Acts chapter 3. If you want to, if you have your Bible, just kind of skim with me as I recount the story from chapter 3 on. Um, chapter 2, you could say, starts the story because there's this, um, this new thing that's happening among God's people that they are meeting in the temple courts. And again, that starts in, in chapter 2. But chapter 3, they've, they've come together as a people. And, and you have to understand that the church did not consider themselves something other than Jewish. They were, a, they were all Jews, and they were, what they felt is they were just good practicing Jews that knew Messiah had come. And so... They did not meet like we meet, separate from Judaism. They found themselves in the center of Judaism, so they, they meet in the temple courts. The portico of Solomon would be a typical place where, where they would meet. And so chapter 3 starts with them moving towards that, and as they're at the temple gates, they see this, this lame guy, and, and God does a miraculous thing, and, and, and he's healed in Jesus' name. And it brings a big crowd, and so the rest of chapter 3 is is Peter preaching to all of these people that are gathered because they've seen this wonderful thing. Chapter 4, Peter gets arrested. And here starts this theme, and I would want you to note the last verse that, that Aaron read um, because it, it, it's the bookend of it. So chapter 4, he's arrested, and the big thing is, what are you doing preaching in Jesus' name? Stop it! Don't preach in Jesus' name. You see the, the collision of the worlds. And do you remember where it ended in, in chapter 5, verse 42? They did not cease speaking in Jesus' name. That's, that's the big context. So in chapter 4, um, Peter, is, uh, Peter and John are arrested. They're brought before the religious leaders. Peter said, we're, we're going to keep on preaching. And uh, the end of chapter 4 is a prayer meeting. And they're asking for boldness, and God does this extraordinary thing that the, the actual room where they were meeting was shaken. If I had time, I'll tell you a story where one time in Ecuador that actually happened to us as well. A Holy Spirit move that was so strong that literally it felt like an earthquake. And the only people that felt it at the campground were the people that were gathered in the room together praying. So, that, that's like a, whoa. And it says at the end of that text, they went forth preaching boldly <laughs> in the name of Jesus. Coming to chapter 5, the Ananias and Sapphira story. Coming out of that, it, it talks about how they're meeting regularly in the temple, house to house, proclaiming the name of Jesus. And then we get into our text 
where the Sanhedrin, these are the big shots, these are the religious rulers, they arrest all of the apostles. And they bring them in, they put them in prison, and miraculously an angel shows up and sets all of those apostles free, and the first thing they do is they go back to the temple to preach the word of God, to, to preach the story of Jesus again. And so the guards go to look for the apostles in the prison. They can't find him. And they come back to the Sanhedrin and said, where are they? And someone says, well, I think they're in the temple. They're doing exactly what you told them not to do. And so they, they bring them in again, like cautiously because they're afraid of a riot. And they bring them in again, and they say, what are you doing? And that's the text that we're looking at today. And it ends by Peter saying, yeah, we're going to just keep on doing this, no matter what you say. And, uh, and it ends in verse 42, saying that they, they go house to house in the temple. They did not cease teaching and preaching that, that the Christ is Jesus. You, you kind of get the big story? This is a collision of worlds, right? These are worlds in in conflict but how do you get your head around what's going on when, when i look at the entire context there is a thread that is woven throughout every one of these stories do, do you know what the thread is you you see it not the first time it's it's actually found in chapter two but in in, in what i just recounted chapter three verse ten says and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him the, the, the word amazement is an emotional blending of fear and wonder it's mentioned 10 other times in the book of acts so um, like i said actually two in chapter 2 verse 43 it says awe awe came upon every soul everyone kept on feeling a sense of awe that was that was a common experience when you go through the gospels what when jesus would do things that word awe was a common experience of people as they interacted with jesus and here as we get in the book of acts the same thing that happened when Jesus walked on the earth continues to happen as Jesus continues to walk on the earth with his people. Those around them and the people themselves have this feeling of awe. So that continues on. And when you get into the immediate context of the text that we're looking at today, you can't help but miss that this is a major word in chapter 5. So for example, chapter 5, verse 5. With the Ananias Sapphira story, it says, And great fear came over all who heard it. Chapter 5, verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church. Chapter 5, verse 13. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. You see that sense of awe that is going on. And in the middle of all of this, you get... This story, in the middle of the story, in verse 20 and 21, <clears throat> they'd been arrested there in jail, and it says, and the angel of the Lord released them, and next word is really significant, <clears throat> commanded them. Like, commanded them, go and stand in the temple and speak to all the people all the words of, of this life that's a gospel phrase so in that context guess what they did immediately i mean if you had an angel show up when you were in jail and he released you and then he told you what you better do next do you think you would do it probably would right you'd probably be a bit overwhelmed with the whole experience and in case any of this is new to some of you these are not made up stories. These are not myths. These are not fables. This is history. This is actually what happened. So it's appropriate for you to imagine yourself in that situation as if it truly occurred because it did. And an angel showed up to them and they were moved by it and immediately they obeyed. 
And you know, as the story continues, this, this theme continues all the way until chapter 8. Because at beginning of chapter 8, that's where it says, and great, great persecution broke out. So from the beginning of chapter 8 on, they don't meet in the temple courts anymore. They can't. But still in the context of all of that, if you go all the way to chapter 9, verse 31, this th same theme continues, and listen to this. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, and look at this, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church continued to increase. Have you ever considered that essential for healthy church living must be, must, must be that we have a deep sense of awe? Fear blended with wonderment. Here's my question. When's the last time you felt that? What's going on in this story in chapter 5? is truly gospel-centered. It's not primarily a story about what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. That's not really what the story's about. It's not really a story of, here are some, some pointers of what you should do when you find yourself in a difficult situation. It's not a lesson of, of being a morally good person in a difficult situation. That is not what the story is about. It's a gospel story, and gospel thinking always starts with who God is and what he has done in the person of Jesus. This is a story about Jesus. It's a story about Jesus being with them and a people being caught up in, in, in the sense of of. What does it look like to live with this powerful, risen Lord in our midst? Really, the, the story of the book of Acts is just a story of Jesus continuing to walk on earth. And, and as they observe that Jesus is with them, these people find themselves seemingly caught up in life transformation. Like their obedience to go back to the temple, to a place of difficulty, it seems effortless. Like there is something inwardly impulsing them, driving them to obey. It, it's, it, it seems, again, almost effortless. Their devotion has changed. What has really big in their life has changed. Their friendships change. Their associations change. Their giving change. They it says they, they hold loosely their possessions. That's what's been happening and it's what continues to happen. And the key verse in the text that we're looking at is verse 31. If you want to get a handle of what's really going on here, look at 31 and look at what's going on in the mind of the apostles. Verse 31 says this. Peter's trying to explain to the Sanhedrin why their worlds are in conflict, why there's a, 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 a collision of worldview. It's because the apostles see Jesus one way and the Sanhedrin sees him completely different. It all comes down to the view of who Jesus is. So Peter explains, God exalted Jesus at his, at God's right hand as leader and Savior. What Peter is saying is, Sanhedrin, religious rulers, here's the one thing that you don't know. This is who Jesus is. He is leader and Savior. That word leader is a huge word in the New Testament. It comes from the Greek word that, 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 that is beginning. So for example, when you go to Revelation chapter 21 and 22 and you know this phrase where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, it's the same word. And the beginning doesn't just mean that Jesus has been around for a long time, which he has been around for a long time. 
He's the firstborn of all creation. It's he's the one that owns the whole thing. He's the one that's in charge. If ever you want to know if you're living right, the answer is, am I living properly aligned to the beginning, to the one who sets all things in motion, to the one who is in charge of all things? And Peter is saying to the Sanhedrin, here's what you don't get. You think you're the beginning, or you think Moses is the beginning, or you think the law is the beginning, but something revolutionary has happened. Jesus is the leader. He's the beginning. And it's so nice to know he's also the Savior. He's the rescuer. If you feel like you're in a situation that you can't get out of, here's what you need to know. Jesus knows what to do, and he'll rescue you, and he'll save you to that end. That was Peter's message to the Sanhedrin. And then the rest of the text says, and that knowledge of who he is calls for a response. Repentance. Do you know what repentance means? I'm sure your pastor has illustrated this a million times. Repentance is you're walking in one direction. You get an aha moment like, whoa, I'm going in the wrong direction. Like my life is completely misoriented and disoriented. And so you... Repentance is you turn around. It's a change of worldview, which results in a change of direction. You see, when you come to the understanding of who Jesus is, that he's leader and savior, it always calls for, say the word, repentance. It always calls for a change of direction. And Peter simply calling them, don't you understand who you're fighting against? This collision of worlds is a collision of your world against the leader, the beginning, and the Savior, the rescuer. That's Peter's message. If you want to get the story of Acts chapter 5, simply define it this way it's a story of awe it's a story of being enamored it's a story of being swept away with a person with who Jesus is and filled with awe in the person of who Jesus is it makes one thing important filled with awe who Jesus is becomes biggest to us so that the most important thing is is that we would represent him well. That's the story. Peter and the apostles are filled with awe and what's biggest to them or what's most important to them is that they would represent Jesus well. That's why in chapter 5, verse 29, Peter says that famous line, we must obey God rather than men and the emphasis is on the word must seeing Jesus as he is we really have no other option <laughs> you Sanhedrin you think that you have the power of our life in your hands we just want you to know you're completely mistaken he is the leader he is the savior you're not we must obey him over you what is big to God? Awe is when what is big to God becomes big to us and it changes us in the very area where our worlds are colliding. Where something challenging has happened to us as awe increases, what is big to us changes so that what's most important to us is who Jesus is and that we would represent him well. Filled with awe, we desire to represent him well with our words. We want to proclaim words that represent our awe in who Jesus is. And, and you see that. That's, that's like the principal thing in these, all these verses is they're, they're just not going to stop speaking in the name of Jesus because filled with awe, they desire to represent him well with their words. But I want you to notice something else. Not only do they have a desire to represent them, re represent him well with their words, they, they want to represent them Jesus well without words. Not only in what they say, 
but in their demeanor, in the way that they say it. And, and you see that so beautifully in the text in their lack of anxiety, right? It just seems like nobody has a grip on them. Actually, I think that they represented Jesus without words better than they did with words. Y you follow what I'm saying? The message uh, that, they, that they portrayed without words, I think was more powerful, more impactful than the message that they said with words. So could you imagine them before the Sanhedrin just crumbling in fear, begging like, guys, don't you understand? We don't really have any other option. Please don't hurt us. Please don't harm us. We have to proclaim the name of Jesus. Don't you understand? I mean, there would be something really messed up about that kind of proclamation. But their, their proclamation with words, Jesus is leader. Jesus is Savior. You're called to repent. And he will rescue you and f forgive you of your sins. That was powerful words because it came out of a non-anxious presence. They had a desire to represent Jesus well with their words, and they had a desire to represent Jesus well without their words. I'm going to tell you a story, and I actually hesitate a little bit to tell you this story because I, I don't want it to make much of Sharon and me. But it is an amazing story of Jesus at work in our day. So, please kind of erase us from this and just look at what Jesus did. So back in the day, I think it was way back in 2008, um, we were in a situation where we were pastoring a church and, and we needed to find a, a home to live in. And so Sharon and I could live anywhere that we wanted to and we decided that we wanted to move into a community where our worlds would be in collision. We, we, we wanted to pick a community where the people were very different than us in every way. Well, I think we did a pretty good job because where we moved in, two doors down, was a drug prostitute house. We moved in in May, and by November, we were wanting to get to know our neighbors, and so we had this, <laughs> now I look back on it, this crazy idea that we were going to bake banana bread and give it to our neighbors, and it was my job to take the banana bread to the drug prostitute house I had forgotten when we made our planning that there was a time change right around there, and so when I'm knocking on the door, it's nighttime. You know, it was 5.30 or whatever, but it was, it was dark. And so I knock on the door, and I get no answer. Well, you don't know me very well, but I, I don't give up real easily. So I knocked on the door again, and, and no answer. And I, I basically end up beating on this door, I'm this white guy, right? I'm, you know, kind of this big white guy, and they probably look through the mirror, and when they see big white guy, what do they probably think? Right, I'm a cop or something like that. So I'm beating on this door. I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm doing the whole thing really well. Eventually, they crack open, and they just say, what do you want? And my answer was, I'm neighbor. I'm your neighbor. I have banana bread for you. Happy Thanksgiving. Like, it didn't go so well. We had other neighbors that as we got to know them, and we were real intentional trying to do things on our street, um, they, they would come to us and they'd say, so you're a pastor? And i say, yeah. And they say, I, I just want you to know we'll, we'll be nice to you and everything like that, but we will never come to your church. In other words, we'll, we'll condition our relationship on this, like please, not, not please, we're just telling you, never invite us to church, don't talk to us about religious things. So you see, there's this collision of worlds. Right next to us lived Crazy Roger, Crazy Roger is, um, yeah, he's just crazy. Um, he would dress weird. He was an older guy. He was, this. I don't mean this in any racial sense at all, but he's a, a Jewish guy, so like his worldview is completely different than mine, but he's certainly not a practicing Jew in any way. He had like a seance demon room in his house. That was like right next to like our bedroom. We'd look across this short driveway, and that was their demon room right there and that that's crazy roger always dressed in black and just a goofy guy we called him crazy roger so in this neighborhood we were doing our best to represent jesus well with our words but as you can imagine yeah there wasn't much impact with our words because our worlds were 
colliding. And we continue to pray for our neighbors and continue to try to do, you know, kind acts to them. And um, the time came where Diane, Crazy Roger's wife, contracted cancer, bone cancer. And um, our small group that met in our home had kind of become noticed because all these people would come into our home and we started to do things on our street and we would put roofs on people's homes and we would clean up yards and just trying to like do a new creation thing right there on Fenimore Street in Vineland, New Jersey. So we were kind of known and Roger, um, crazy Roger one day said, um, Nate, um, with, with Diane's cancer, she can't do stairs, but we've got to get her to treatment is there any way that your people could help us get a, a ramp? And so I got my people together and we looked at it, but just the way it worked, it was impossible. We, 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 couldn't, we couldn't make a ramp work for Crazy Roger and Diane. But I felt compelled to love them. So I said, um, Roger, here's what we'll do. We can't do a ramp for you. And if, even if we do, city ordinance and stuff like that, it's going to take us a long time. You need some help this week. So... Roger, here's, here's, here's the deal. Um, every day that you need to take Diane um, and you need help getting her down the stairs, you call me and I'll rearrange my schedule and I will be there and I will help. I'll help Diane get down the stairs. So literally the task was that I would put my hands around her ankles and I would be down below her, and Roger would try to keep her stable here, and I would lift her ankle, swollen, deformed, often, excuse me, often poop-encrusted. And I would lift up her foot, and I would put it down to the next one, and I would hold her stable and put her down the three steps. And then I would come back, and later on, and I would, I would take her back up. When... When Diane failed more and she was homebound and they had a hospital bed, Roger would need someone to help him clean her and Roger would need help to like scoot her back up to the front, uh, top of the bed when she would slide down. And, and uh, so I would go over and I would sit with Roger and I would sit with Diane. And Diane, I think, fell in love with me. I don't know why. I hope it was Jesus. But she would, she would lock her gaze on me and I would tell her about Jesus. My biggest longing was to represent Jesus well. And I had opportunity to speak, to represent him well with words. But I think the reason that I could represent him well with words is because by God's grace, he enabled me to represent him well without words. And it wasn't long until in those staring conversations where Diane and I were together and Roger would be over in the kitchen. I, I said, Diane, do you want to place your faith in Jesus? And with tears, she said, yes. And I got to pray with Diane. And I remember when she eventually was taken to a hospice, like residential thing, and I would go and visit her and I would place my hands on her and pray for her. Everybody said she had just such a deep sense of peace through bone cancer, which you know is going to be very painful. After Diane died, Roger was completely devastated. And um, <clears throat> so we would just go over and sit with him. <clears throat> and I remember one day Roger said to me, <clears throat> kind of like this, Nate, I want you to do to me what you did to, to Diane. And I said, Diane, I said, Roger, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, no, just do, do to me what you did with Diane. Do that to me. And I said, Roger, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Like, what are you talking about? Like, am I supposed to lift up your legs? Like, I don't, I don't know help you in bed he said no when you would like talk to her about jesus and then you prayed with her i want that and this crazy guy who at that point literally when we were going to the home had his little demon room little seance room in that very home he prayed to receive christ as his savior he started going to our church he cleaned out the room it was like just, I don't know, a couple months ago, we were back in Vineland, and <laughs> my wife is kind of crying because she loved our street. I mean, Sharon was really the impetus for all of this. 
that she loved the people on our street. We still do, and so we would go back to Vineland, and we go to our street, and, and I saw Roger one day when we were just driving through the street, and I said, I got to pull over, and so I, I got out, and Roger was going up, like trying to get up his stairs, still didn't have a ramp, and he's an older guy. And I said, Roger, and I'm yelling at him, Roger, and he looked at me like he didn't recognize me. I said, Roger, and he just like started to weep, Nate, Nate, come in come in and i had to literally go someplace else so i spent just maybe 10 minutes with roger and i said roger i have to go and he said no you can't go i said roger no I, I really have no you can't go and i said roger i'll come back and he looked at me he said will you promise me nate will you promise me will you promise me that you'll come back and stay with me for a long time do you get the point Again, please erase us from that. Just the point that I want you to get is that, that when you get a taste of who Jesus is and the awe of who he is, what becomes biggest when worlds are colliding is that you would represent him well with your words and without your words. And there's nothing more important to you than representing Jesus well. And the truth is that when we pay attention to when our worlds collide, the battle there is a battle for awe. It's a battle for what's biggest to you. And sadly, what happens in that moment is our convenience sometimes is what's biggest. Or being right is sometimes what's biggest. Or our, like, that we, I mean, honestly, sometimes our political persuasions become what's biggest. Like we just have to get our point and, and show them that we're right and we argue with them to, to let them know that, that they're out of favor because they disagree with us. And all the while in the collision of worlds, what's become most important is literally something other than representing Jesus well. Look again at the text. Did Peter ever make it personal about them? He just simply, in a non-anxious way, said, guys, this is the truth, and we're not really intimidated by you at all. And his message had punch. Here's the truth. If you lose your awe for Jesus, you will lose your voice. You lose your awe, and you will lose your impact a heartless faith is a weak faith. It just doesn't do much at all. It doesn't change much at all. But a heart-filled faith is powerful. And it's the very power of God. Cultivating awe. I don't know, Aaron, if you've ever told him the story of Blaise Pascal. Any mathematicians in the room? Every mathematician knows who Blaise Pascal is. Blaise Pascal had sewn into the lining of his jacket that he wore every day a note. He didn't share it with anybody, but he kept it right there, close to his heart. I want, you, I want to read you what, what Blaise Pascal kept near him to cultivate awe. The year of grace, 1654, Monday. 23rd November from about half past 10 at night until about half past midnight fire God of Abraham God of Isaac God of Jacob not of the philosophers and of the learned certitude certitude feeling joy peace God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God. Your God will be my God. Forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God. He is only found by the ways taught in the gospel. Grandeur of human soul. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. Joy, 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 tears of joy. Do you get a bit of awe in Blaise Pascal? And it was 
Pascal, the great mathematician, the great man of logic who said, the heart has its reasons which reason does not know. I'm not at all encouraging you to have a reasonless faith. And, and I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't use our head at all, but the driving force in the book of Acts is fire. It's fire. And it says that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized they had been with Jesus. I'm not saying that you don't speak for Jesus until you feel like it. But if you keep in mind that you are designed to be a person who is driven by awe, then even when you lack a sense of awe in who Jesus is, it will influence you and you'll speak out of a repentant heart saying, I don't even feel deeply enough about what is essential in life. Lastly, I'll say this and then I'll pray. This is not really a message on a how-to. The gospel doesn't start with a how-to. The gospel always starts with who Jesus is and what he has done, and it is to impact us. But I will say, if you have any stirring in your heart that you recognize that it's been a long time since you've encountered awe, I want to point you in three directions. Number one, it's God's word. It's the written word of God. But you read God's word to find awe. Number two, be honest. Don't fake it. When you lack it, be honest about it. If it's been a long time since you have cultivated awe in your life and your Christian faith has become more a matter of routine and just kind of doing the right thing and, and it's rather comfortable i heard this week that happy valley is all about comfort and if happy valley is some kind of sucked you into just the comfort and 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 you've just it's been a while since you've been outside that little comfort zone just be honest about it be honest with a friend tell somebody about it and last i think the the clearest application point is get your feet on mission Get on mission. Get out of your comfort zone and step into a situation where there is a collision of worlds and you've determined you're going to represent Jesus well. Find a neighbor with cancer. Find somebody you absolutely disagree with. <laughs> that your worldview is exactly contrary to them and move towards them with the desire to represent Jesus well. Find someone whose lifestyle actually sickens you. Move towards them. Put yourself into a place of mission. And I know there's a lot of people in this room that are my age or older, and I'm telling you, it's never too late. It's never too late. There are people in your world that are waiting for a representation of Jesus. Step into it. So Lord Jesus, thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for this text. Thank you that the word of God is alive. It's living and active. And it disorients us and then it orients us. It, it, it shifts us and then it settles us. It makes us uncomfortable and then it brings us comfort. So allow the penetrating word of God to just rumble through our souls as we think of the centrality of awe as followers of Jesus. Amen. Church, after that message of challenge, we're going to sing a song of commitment that's not just about one time in our lives, but about a choice we need to keep making to put our eyes 
on Jesus and follow him. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Would you stand and join us in hymn number 602 this morning as we close? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me. Cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though not go with me. Is the Lord rekindling something in your heart this morning? I hope that you're encouraged as you're walking with Jesus. If you need to spend a little time with him today, we want to encourage you to do a couple of things. Maybe you need some time just on the mercy seat, just to come forward at the end of the services to be with him. I do that frequently just to say I need the Lord to speak in my heart and rekindle some work in me. It's been a long time since I've sensed the awe of his presence, so that's a good thing for us to ask. Maybe that's something that you would take with you even as you go today. Uh, if you need a prayer partner, we've got folks that will be up here on either side of the platform after the service. If you've got a special need, uh, don't leave with that need. We'd love to pray with you and to pray for you, to pray over you. That's a beautiful uh, thing to take advantage of today. We want to encourage you in that. And if you're joining us online, you can click the prayer button as well. And uh, we've got some folks on our prayer team that would love to pray with you. I want to leave you with this benediction. This is the, the, the ancient benediction from number six that we've given many times, but I love this idea of his face being turned toward us. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you back here again very soon. God bless you.